Glory to Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We see here a chaste virgin, which is very important to our Lord Jesus Christ. Because indeed, having been espoused to him, we are going to be his wife, and he's going to be our husband. You remember all the way in the beginning, in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And so we, the saints, the church, as the bride of Christ, we have been espoused to him as a chaste virgin. Now, because we all know that the Lord told us that he is holy and that he wants us to be holy as he is if we are going to be united to him because the church is the body of Christ. Let us quickly, brothers and sisters, go to scriptures to remind ourselves and establish that Christ is our head and that the church, the bride, is his body. We go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so we see indeed the relationship, Christ being the head of the church, which is his body. We further continue in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so we understand that the perfecting of the saints is for the edifying of those same saints as they are the body of Christ and need to be edified. And verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Lastly, we go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Indeed, brothers and sisters, on that point, we are servants of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, as Paul expresses in Philemon, in the very first verse, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer, and so a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so we are called to his service. And so further in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, for he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men, because we are to be the servants of Christ. We are the saints, we are the bride, we are the spouse, and therefore we are his servant. Whether in the flesh we be servants, we are made free in that we are set free to serve Christ, or whether we be free in the flesh, we become nonetheless his servant. And so whichever condition we find ourselves in, there is no getting around it. We are going to serve him, and we will be his prisoners. But from the standpoint of being the bride, the church is going to serve Christ and be considered akin to a spouse. And so having said this on a side note, we get back to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, and we were simply commenting about verse 22, to show the relationship that we have to Christ as servants, 
which justifies that we submit ourselves unto him in the same manner that the wife is supposed to submit herself unto her husband. And we, as the bride of Christ, we submit ourselves to Christ, whom we serve, of whom we are prisoners, for we were bought with a price. We are talking about being the bride of Christ, of having been reserved as a chaste virgin to be espoused to Christ. We are talking about our relationship to Christ as the church, the bride of Christ, his body. We continue in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And so we are confirming that Christ is the head of the church and that the church is the bride of Christ, his body. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. We will touch on sanctification a bit later in this study, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot. Remember a chaste virgin, Paul had said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Not having spot, a chaste virgin, or wrinkle, or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so these are powerful requirements that we are to satisfy in order to be a glorious church, in order to be a chaste virgin in the eyes of Christ. And this will connect later to the importance of sanctification. Verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And so, brothers and sisters, what have we seen thus far? Setting things in order. We started out with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, reminding us that Paul says that we have been espoused to one husband as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then we took time to reestablish the relationship that we have with Christ by looking at a few scriptures in Ephesians to establish and confirm that Christ is our head and that we, the bride, the church, the body, the saints, and we are one with him and he is our head and we are prisoners of him. We have been bought with a price and we are his servants and we submit to him. Now that we have gone over these preliminary things, we can go into the core subject that I'm trying to highlight in this study, which is now to look for a prefiguration of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, in the Old Covenant. In order to do that, we have to first again remember a few things about who Christ is in one of his infinite aspects. More specifically, we have to remember how Christ is our high priest. Let us now go, therefore, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, with a capital A, and high priest 
with capital H and P, of our profession, Christ Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is our high priest in one of his many and even infinite aspects or facets. And indeed, brothers and sisters, he did a great thing for us because he is the one who interceded for us and went in under the tent in the spiritual tabernacle to offer his own blood on our behalf to the Father. We are in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so the important point here is that he is our high priest. Why are we mentioning this? Again, because as we have been reserved as a chaste virgin for Christ, we are going to find in the Old Covenant that there was a prefiguration of a high priest having a requirement to have a chaste virgin for a wife. And that's us, the bride, the body of Christ, the church. That is the saints. And so here we're establishing and remembering how Christ is our high priest and what he did for us in that capacity. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So this is for the priests in general. Now we're looking at what the high priest would do. Verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. And so this is just a reminder that the high priest was the one going in alone once every year, to intercede for the people, and he had blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now we know that Christ did this just one time, and that he did not offer a sacrifice for himself because he did no sin. But we're just here highlighting the role of the high priest, because Christ is our high priest, and he went in the spiritual tabernacle on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So indeed, Christ went into the spiritual tabernacle. And so indeed, we have references in the book of Exodus concerning how Moses built the tabernacle, the physical tabernacle, in the image of the spiritual tabernacle. Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, According to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Still in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 40, And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was shewed thee in the mount. And lastly, in the book of Exodus, chapter 26, verse 30, And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof, which was shewed thee in the mount. And so these scriptures in Exodus are just to remind us that regarding Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, how Christ did not enter into the holy places made with hands, but rather into heaven itself in the spiritual tabernacle, to appear in the presence of God for us. And we were speaking about this because we are establishing that indeed he is our high priest. Now, getting back to the top, setting things in order yet again, we started out with 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, 
to remind ourselves that our jealous God has kept us, reserved us, so that we be espoused to one husband, that we may be presented as chaste virgins, as a chaste virgin to Christ, as his bride, his body, so that we can be one with him, him being the head, and we are subject to him, his servants, his prisoners, his bride, his wife. And there is a requirement that we be chaste. Now, why is that important? Because having established that indeed there is a relationship between us and Christ, between us, the saints, the body, the church, we have established that we are his bride, his wife, and that we are going to be, quote unquote, one flesh with him in the image of what we saw in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that the husband and the wife are to be one flesh. Now, spiritually, we're going to be one with Christ, and he will be the head and we will be the body. But Christ being a high priest, there are requirements for his bride. And we saw here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, that there be a strict requirement that the bride be a chaste virgin to be espoused to one husband. Having established the relationship that we have with Christ with verses that were cited from Ephesians, and having cited further verses from Hebrews to establish that Christ is indeed our high priest, now we can connect 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, to the prefiguration that we find in Leviticus, which already indicated that the bride, the wife of the high priest, had to be spotless, had to be chaste, had to be a virgin. Let us go to it now. Brothers and sisters, we are in the book of Leviticus, chapter 21, verses 10 to 15. And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured. And see, this is prophetic because the Christ is a translation for the Mashiach, which means the anointed one, the Messiah. And so, starting again at verse 10, and he that is the high priest on the one hand, and he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. We are talking about the high priest. We are talking about a foreshadowing of Christ. Verse 11, Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Verse 13, and this is the verse I wanted to get to. And he shall take a wife in her virginity. I repeat, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. And so this was an absolute requirement for a high priest. Now we are not under the Mosaic law, granted, but we see the origin of the requirement of a high priest taking a wife that is a chaste virgin. And we better understand why in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul is stressing out that he has reserved us and set us apart as a chaste virgin, that is the church, the bride of Christ, that he has set us apart as a chaste virgin for Christ, who is a jealous God. And so verse 13 again, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. Verse 14, a widow or a divorced woman or profane or an harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. 
Verse 15, Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. And so we see that the Lord sanctifies. He performs sanctification. He is the author of sanctification. And therefore, brothers and sisters, a chaste virgin is espoused to Christ. And we, the bride, the church, that's us. And there is a requirement that we be taken in our virginity, meaning we have to be pure. We go to the general epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This last part of this verse, brothers and sisters, we tend to be forgetful about it. We usually remember that James 1.27 points to the fact that religion of men, that is, systems and protocols set up by men based on their own traditions, that these are not what is pleasant to the Lord, but rather pure religion, which is of the Lord, which has us serving Christ, of whom we are servants, of whom we are prisoners, who bought us with a price, pure religion, not religion of men, which is undefiled before God and the Father, we're talking about pure religion, is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. We tend to remember that first part, but we neglect the last part, to keep himself unspotted from the world. Why? Because a chaste virgin cannot be tainted and has to be unspotted from the world, which, of course, brothers and sisters, correlates with 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, where we are told, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see that we are called to be unspotted from the world, and to not love the world, so that we can indeed be a chaste virgin, espoused unto Christ, a jealous God. And yes, indeed, of a truth, brothers and sisters, on many occasions, the Lord has let us know that he is holy. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 44, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 2, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Further, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 7, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And all these statements about the holiness of the Lord. We were told about them again in the New Covenant in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so, brothers and sisters, we are talking about ourselves, the saints, the bride of Christ, the church, the body of Christ, that we have been espoused to one husband, that we may be presented as a chaste virgin to Christ. And we started off there. And after that, we established the relationship that connects us to Christ as his bride, as his body, as the church, that is, as the saints, and that he is our head, and that we are part of one body with him, in the same manner that a man and a woman shall be one flesh, united, 
we then moved on and proceeded to show that Christ indeed is our high priest and that he is our intermediate, Jesus Christ the man, Yehoshua HaMashiach the man. He is our sole intermediate to God. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so further, therefore, having established that Christ is our high priest who interceded for us, we then moved on to return to Leviticus in the Old Covenant, though we are not under the Mosaic Law, to underline that there was a prefiguration or a foreshadow of the requirement of the Bride of Christ to be a chaste virgin and that it would be an absolute requirement so that we could find the origin or at least one of the origins of this principle being enunciated here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. And this brought us to Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13. And so we had read, starting at Leviticus chapter 21, verse 10, and he that is the high priest among his brethren, and that is the image of Christ as our high priest, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and this is the very definition prophetically of the Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. And moving forward to verse 13, which was of interest, speaking of the high priest, verse 13, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. Verse 14, a widow or a divorced woman or profane or an harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to wife. And so this is the perfect image that we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, as we are reserved, set aside as a chaste virgin for Christ. And we see here in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13, that there was already in the Mosaic law a requirement that was absolute that the high priest should take a wife in her virginity. We are in the book of Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. And so we have a clear depiction here that the Lord is giving us the importance of virginity and how we are to be exclusive to the Lord, even beyond having been taken as a chaste virgin. And so the loyalty, and not rather give way to adultery. Or if we look at things from a spiritual perspective, even spiritual whoredom. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 12, My people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err and they have gone a-whoring from under their God. The spirit of whoredoms from a spiritual perspective, which correlates in the physical to the works of adultery. Let us not forget, brothers and sisters, that our God is a jealous God. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 3 to 5, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, as we just saw and examined in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 12. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, I'm a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Yes, brothers and sisters, a jealous God. And so getting back to the top, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. We have just seen the jealousy of our jealous God. For I have espoused you to one husband, a husband and a wife coming together to be one, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, Christ being our high priest, there being a requirement for the high priest to have a chaste virgin, a wife in her virginity, a wife unspotted from the world, a wife bought with a price, a wife for whom Christ interceded in the spiritual tabernacle as a high priest, a wife who serves him and is subject to him, the bride, the church, a wife that abides in sanctification because God is holy and we are to be holy as well if we're going to be one with him. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And this is why we spoke earlier about being unspotted from the world, James 1, 27, and also not loving the things of this world. 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. And this because, brothers and sisters, in 1 John chapter 1, if we go to verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We are talking about holiness we are talking about God being light, and therefore, if we desire to have communion with him, then we must be like him and put on the same nature and put on Christ. Let us read the beginning of this chapter in 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If you want fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, you need to be light, for God is light and there is no darkness in him. Verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Again, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13, The high priest, Christ, and he shall take a wife, in her virginity. That was already specified as a requirement under the Old Covenant concerning the Mosaic Law. And though we be not under the Mosaic Law, we see the foreshadow. We see the prefiguration of that requirement that is an absolute one. When Paul addresses us in the New Covenant in 2 Corinthians 11.2, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, we're going to look at this and consider the importance of sanctification, holiness, because we are talking about a chaste virgin. And so now we can discuss sanctification and holiness as a second aspect of this verse. We have firstly considered where the requirement of chastity was integrated in the Mosaic Law. 
to then see that it is echoed in 2 Corinthians 11.2. Firstly, we had seen this, and now secondly, we're looking at sanctification, by which we can establish that we satisfy the requirement of being holy, of being light, of being unspotted from the world, how we are not a wife put away, or a wife of whoredom, or a divorced wife, but rather a chaste virgin, espoused to one husband, Christ, our high priest. So here we go now, moving on to sanctification and its importance. For this part, I would like to go through some scriptures that deal with sanctification and its importance, and that ultimately highlight that God is the author of that sanctification that he works in us. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place called upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And holiness pertains to sanctification. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the very God of peace sanctify you. And so God will sanctify us and keep us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And through his truth, because his word is truth, John 17, 17, as we had mentioned earlier. And so we have gone over the main point of this study, brothers and sisters. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We saw that we serve a jealous God. We saw that the church is the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and he is the head, and that we serve him. We saw that Christ is the high priest, and that there was a requirement for the high priest in Leviticus in the Mosaic law, to take a wife in her virginity 
and it was an absolute requirement. And therefore, in order for us to be a chaste virgin, we saw that there are many instances where we are reminded about the importance of sanctification and that God will sanctify us. Now, these were the requirements for the high priest. Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. And we saw that the virginity of the chaste bride, of the chaste virgin, was also expressed in terms of being unspotted from the world and not touching the unclean thing and not loving the things of this world. And concerning the Lord himself, we had seen that on many occasions he has reminded us that he is holy. And if we want to have communion with him, we have to be light as he is light, for he is light and there is no darkness in him. And so if we commune with him, we have to be holy as he is holy so that we can be one as husband and wife. May you be blessed, brothers and sisters, in the mighty name of Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Amen.